So this is um, it's a kind of ongoing way, but I've used an active word here, seeking synergies through geometric and wave-based techniques. So maybe that'll kind of um, tell you this is more kind of like things in progress, but hopefully some, some interesting ideas. Um, so just, just a quick outline, just going to talk about a quick introduction to what, we're, what I'm looking at, uh, room acoustic simulation, um, the motivation for it, some, uh, some of the challenges. Um, and then I'm going to say why well, I'm interested in synergies between geometric methods, which are used so widely, and a wave method, in this case, boundary element method, uh, the one that I'm particularly looking at. Um, then I'm going to talk a bit about them with boundary element method with oscillatory basis functions. So these are the type of functions that give basically what comes out of the model some sort of slightly beam like characteristics. Uh, I'm going to talk in syner about synergies in how sound is scattered from these, what's, what's similar between this wave method and these high frequency geometric methods. Um, and sense of synergies on how reflections are detected as well. So it's kind of two parts, how does sound come out from something and then go and be received somewhere else. Um, then I'm going to talk about sort of choosing what kind of sets of wave directions you might use with that. I thought that made more sense to get to it. And then a little, just as a little roundup. So first of all, uh, I've just got an introduction. I threw a few more slides in here because because my said that uh, not all of you had a room acoustics background. I have since been sit on the train reading dissertations, half of which are about room acoustic simulation. So, here we are. Uh, so, people have for a long time been kind of like trying to simulate things like concert halls was uh, one of the original kind of drivers, big high sort of prestige, high stakes, high value projects, where you might want to basically know that the thing's going to work well before you build it. And you've got a source somewhere in the room, and then you've got a receiver, some audience member, and they're going to hear sound directly from the source, but they're from other reflections coming from different places, and then they're going to hear them from different directions as well. And originally this was done a lot with scale models, but there's quite a lot of limitations and problems with doing that, so people started trying to do it with computer modeling instead. Um, and this has now become so widespread that people use it for all sorts of rooms, including teaching rooms that are quite echoey in this particular case. Um, and hospitals, schools, foyers, theatres, you know, they're used for all sorts of things now. So they're very widely used. One of the recent uh, trends that developed more and more, and I know some of you guys uh, will already know quite a bit about, is the concept that you might oralise a room. So rather than um, just doing what people traditionally did, which get one of these models and what the output was, was just some kind of figures that said is it similar, so these kind of objective room acoustic metrics like reverb time, early lateral energy fraction, stuff like that, things that people have used to study concert halls, people start to say, well actually, we want to actually play the sound of these rooms to people. And this has really driven a kind of increase in resolution in the data that these models need to output, because you don't just need enough to calculate you know, the reverb time in different third octave bands or something, you now need enough to actually get a room impulse response at some sample frequency you know, that matches human hearing and play back audio to people so they can actually hear this thing. So the, the resolution of data is, is now a lot higher than it used to be. And this is something people are doing more and more. So this is a room, this is the room in New York actually, uh, the Arab office over there, their, their sound lab, um, myself and Brian and Stefan, um, recently, well, recently a year ago, almost to the day, I think, um, I had to watch up at the Arab office in Manchester where we all went and uh, talked about sort of new technologies and <coughs> developments to, to, to improve computer simulation and, and this oralization process. And um, this is really all about getting people in your stakeholders, so maybe they're people who might use the building or people who might control the money for the building. Um, uh, and get them in and basically help them understand what they're paying for, really. That if you're going to do some acoustic treatment, that rather than just go, oh, well, your early lateral energy fractions now, it's much better than it was, over T T60s are now down by 0.3. Um, you actually get them when you play right. If you spend this much money, it's going to sound like that. If you play this much money, it's going to sound like that. <laughs> uh, and people are already doing this a lot, but it's to a certain extent, it's about... The, it's about plausibility. I mean, I think at the moment it's fair to say that it's more like a tool that aids discussion and one that has real, true physical accuracy. No one really expects that you run one of these models and um, 
and then it will actually sound exactly like that if you walked in there. So if someone's trying to do a round robin, the Germans are trying to do a round robin at the moment where you, everyone tries to do this for some different rooms and we'll actually listen to them all. Uh, and Brian was just talking about why they're doing it badly. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, so, so this is, this is something that's, that's kind of increasing. Uh, and I think acoustic consultants are key, uh, helps them sell stuff, uh, they take people in the room, look showy, makes acoustics seem important. So, so it is, it's definitely something that's increasing. So just to how do people actually do this? Well, the kind of, very much the kind of everyday acoustic prediction people do is largely by geometric methods, so basically kind of ray or particle tracing. So you imagine some rays kind of coming out from the source, representing sound firing out in different directions, and it's like some sort of ping pong ball bomb, I think. And off it goes, and off they fire. And for the most part, you know, we're kind of capturing the wave fronts here, but you end up being a lot of rays, you get some random odd ones firing off in odd directions where they hit small stuff. One of the real challenges in these sorts of models is that um, you might find that you know, a ray just hits something in a room that's actually really small. So you know, maybe a ray comes along and you know, hits off the back of my laptop and goes up there, and the computer will tell you that's a really strong, important reflection because the, the ray came and hit it and bounced off. But actually, in reality, the, the, the size of that panel is incredibly small, um, which means that from a wave physics perspective, it's not important, but that sort of thing isn't built into these models. And acousticians have to spend a lot of time taking the CAD models they get from architects and simplifying them, you know, turning stairs cases into simple planes and things like this, so that these methods don't go horribly wrong. So, um, yeah, so we're going to imagine sound in the only straight line like a particle. These algorithms originally came from computer graphics, um, but you get things like you introduce delay, we'll introduce maybe kind of scattering of rays according to surface roughness, we might approximate very low order, first order diffraction possibly. Um, but one of the main key reasons why people use them is the computational cost is relatively low and it's independent of frequency. So you do the whole order bandwidth easily. The questions are just how accurate it is. So you can do it, the question is how accurate it is. On the other hand, you have wave methods, uh, and I, uh, I think uh, <coughs> Stefan might know where this animation has come from. I will, I will own immediately I've stolen this off a ex PhD student at Salford called John Schiefer, who I know came and collaborated with some of you guys a bit. He was working on uh, GP, GPU acceleration of finite difference time domain methods, and that is where this is how this animation has been generated. Um, I'm going to talk about boundary element. FTVD is much better at making videos, that's one of the really important uh, conclusions. Um, but you can see here, particularly if I just rewind, oh, hello, if I particularly just rewind, you not only get kind of first order diffraction sound bending round things, but really crucially you get sound that bend round things that then can diffract round other things, and we'll get all the wave behaviours like standing waves and stuff, which geometric methods just basically can't do. I, I was saying to, to Brian on the way over here, there's some geometric methods would do something like the bassoon player over the pit wall and you know over the pit wall in the theatre and then to the audience. But you'd never do they could never do the bassoon over the pit wall and then kind of diffracting over the front of the balcony, for example. You, you can often some of them will do kind of one order diffraction, but it's pretty much universally not possible to do two, for example. Whereas all these kind of methods would do that sort of thing immediately. So, uh, yes, yeah, so we can directly simulate the wave equation in these methods. It naturally includes hole and diffraction. Um, but what we will see is that because we're basically doing this by chopping up the air into little boxes that are inversely proportional um, to frequency, they, they scale with its wavelength. So, for a certain size room, we'll have a lot more of them, and the computational cost goes up dramatically with frequency. So we'll find that we can't use these at very high frequencies just because the computers aren't powerful enough that these guys are working very hard to make sure that, to, 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 to reduce the extent to which that's the case. So we really have this kind of two paradigms. Uh, we have these sort of different frequency regions where we do things very differently. We have these low frequency methods where it's all about waves and diffraction and standing waves and lots of wave kind of physics-y stuff. And then we have uh, sound going around like ping pong balls and laser beams kind of firing off walls like they're mirrors. Uh, and it's a bit kind of like never the two shall meet. There's this sort of hole in the middle and what, what are we going to do there? And um, really so far the, the 
process has been that these guys are, are trying to do things like introduce low order diffraction so that they can push that way. The new guys are getting loads and loads of high end graphics cards and running them all red hot and using all the electricity in Scotland and um, pushing that way to the point where we get to some sort of thing in the middle and we kind of cross these two over and we stretch them until they meet and cross them over. Uh, because we need data for the entire orbital bandwidth if we're going to actually do this uh, oralisation. We're going to need the whole bandwidth. We can't have a gap in the middle where there's nothing if we're going to listen to it. And that's okay, but there's, there's quite a few questions about this. And I mean, I, mean, I was reading some of these th uh, dissertations on the train where they're basically doing this, and I mean, they quite rightly did some conceptual testing to see how well this worked. Um, but there's, there's some really kind of crucial questions. I mean, how do you pick this frequency? How do you line these things up at the crossover point? How do you talk about like, what the phase should be? Or how are you really going to join these simulations up when they're so, so different? This one's got little pressure in boxes pulling on one another, and this one's got sound going around in straight lines. They're, they're so different, it's going to be very, very difficult to get anything useful. So this is, that's kind of really what this talk about is about, and I'm sort of um, most interested in trying to plug that hole and think about the fact that actually in reality there's this kind of intermediate region where we're still dealing with wave effects, we're still dealing with sound coming in and you know, uh, reflections off surfaces, so you get some diffraction around the back here, it's not quite as simple as that, but you can see that these leading order directions are still present in those models. So there's a kind of, there, is a, there is a mid frequency range that people don't really do, basically because it's difficult. Um, and, and I'm basically interested in joining these things up. Now I should kind of issue some caveats about that. Um, at the moment, what people do, uh, if you think of an impulse response in a room, so like if you've just got a, and what comes back, then what you get is you get your direct sound, you get certain reflections off walls that arrive very early, uh, that are very important spatial cues. Uh, for me, if I walk close to this wall, I can hear my voice get bassier due to an early reflection off the wall, for example. They're the really important spatial cues. It tells me I'm about to walk into the wall. Later on, this is more like a sort of subjective impression of space. It's a subjective impression of reverberation. It's both very expensive to compute deterministically and actually, to a certain extent, pointless because our brain doesn't really process it in, in that kind of same, with that same level of detail, so why would we try to generate it? Drawing, uh, trying to draw something more like a spectrogram, and literally draw with a pencil uh, in this particular case. I think we need to replace this slide with a natural measurement, but so far the pencil drawing is uh, holding out. Um, so if you kind of think of sort of time and frequency and darkness representing intensity of energy and that kind of band, then what you would see is you'd see that these early reflections would be very sort of sharp and localised across all frequencies. Then later on you're going to get a sort of stochastic kind of reverberant mess up here. But down at the bottom we've still got what's called a low modal density. Certain resonances of the space, room resonances, room modes, and they're going to kind of hang out and be distinct that way. So this is the kind of pattern idealised that we're going to look at. So at the moment, um, existing high frequency geometric methods distinguish between early and late time due to this reflection density. So what you typically see is something deterministic at the front here. So beam tracing or image source tend to be the typical algorithms people use there. Um, we'll say a little bit more about beam tracing in a minute. And then one of these sort of stochastic methods, sort of one of these computer graphics adapted methods that's got better computational cost scale with impulse response length up the late time here. Then at the bottom we've got um, the low mode density dictates the low frequency of power. We need to actually do a proper wave solution down here. So we're going to have something like bare boundary element method or finite element method or finite difference time domain down the bottom here. And well, I've left a bit of a gap. Maybe you guys are doing a bit better. Maybe enjoy the look. What I'm really talking about trying to do is sort of switch this round and rather than having low and then this division there, it's kind of switch it the other way. So that actually there's more like a unified full bandwidth approach here and then pass some transition order with a stochastic method and then some sort of other wave method down here. Um, and I've, um, I, I, the actual names of the arguments I've chosen to put in these boxes is very much my own personal preference. There is, there is kind of a reason for it. 
Um, now I'm going to talk about boundary element method, which is based on these kind of integral representation, integral equation of representations of scattering from surfaces. And there are other methods um, which are based on that same kind of approach. So there's a there's a version of ray tracing, acoustic ray tracing called acoustic radiance transfer. Uh, and there's a sort of new version of that coming out of the University of Nottingham and a few other groups called discrete flow mapping, which are ray tracing algorithms, but they're actually based on surface, surface to surface mappings. Um, similarly, this is, some, this is some other type of, some specific type of boundary algorithm method that works in the time domain and is particularly good for late time modeling. I'm going to mostly think about what might happen here and how we might put something together that was the same kind of thing that people have used, uh, deterministic um, early time model actually did the way bit right at the bottom here really is what I'm kind of interested in. So let me just kind of surmise again where, 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 where we're up to. So if I think about high frequency, I'm going to sort of imagine beam tracing here. So I'm going to sound, assume sound goes in straight lines, rather than rays I'm going to think more like sort of beams. Um, so I'm going to have some sound coming in here, so this is like a plane wave coming in from this direction and it's going through space and it hits an obstacle and the first thing that happens is the obstacle creates a shadow. So now we've got a region where we can hear the plane wave and a region where we can't. I should say that the, this beam satisfies the wave equation, it's, it's, it's perfectly valid in this region. The region where it isn't is across that boundary, the little sort of switch there, whenever you walked across it you'd, you'd hear something and then suddenly click and you don't. That's the bit where it doesn't satisfy the, the wave equation, so that's kind of the bit where the problem is. Off here we're then going to get reflections and we can say geometrically basically where they're going to go by kind of Snell's law angle of instance equals angle of reflection, where those beams are going to reflect off to. And again we're in a situation where these beams have kind of like a plane wave, that they satisfy the wave equation within these regions but there's, on the boundary there's a bit of a problem, there should be some diffraction there to join them all up nicely. Computational cost of this is independent frequency, scales for reflection order instead, which is why you're only using it fairly early in the impulse response time, because it's going to get more and more expensive the further you go through. Um, but fairly accurate at high frequencies for most scenarios, I kind of said that already. Then we have um, then we have sort of low frequency methods. So the first thing you might do, like the FTDD, is, is choose to chop the volume up uh, and model the wave behaviour by dis discretising the median and computing how neighbouring cells interact. Um, so this is kind of you know all these little this is like to do these little boxes and sort of talking to the next little box. Um, one, of the, one of the things about that is all the wave terms, be them incident, reflected, you know, first reflections, second order reflections, they're all stored together as samples in the grid versus time. They're not separate like they are in a geometric method. So that's kind of a very different way of representing sound. It's a perfectly valid way, it's a very useful way. Uh, I should be careful what I say really, given that I might get lynched when I leave from my belly. Um, and, uh, and particularly if you're dealing with, with media um, where there's flow or there's different in homogeneities. So in a room, rooms are nice and easy because generally there's no wind in a room. Generally there's not much temperature gradient in a room. The, the things that make the acoustic maths relatively easy, this is why geometric methods are so successful. Things like FTDD will work well in cases where all those things are present. Uh, but I'm, I'm thinking of the simpler case of room acoustics where they're usually not. Um, so this is quite different to how, how geometric acoustics works. Uh, also, creating compatible source definitions is, is relatively difficult. I think it's a problem that has, it's probably fair to say it's largely now been solved. Um, but if you read any papers to do with coupling FTDD with geometric methods, what you'll usually see is loads and loads of stuff about how you you know, how you calibrate the source levels for the different methods or, you know, because they've all been implemented very differently. So, very useful, but I would say that in terms of unification with this other, this other geometric approach is quite unlikely, in my opinion. In contrast, if you looked at boundary element method, then what you have 
um, is you have we're going, to, we're going to work by discretizing the surface elements and um, model the way you behave your off the surface rather than in the domain. Um, so we're basically, we are basically working with reflections off the surface. So to that extent, it's similar to the geometric method, which where sound went through the air until it basically hit something and reflected. So that was effectively called surface. <coughs> this is basically sort of the same. So the solution, the actual what the acoustic behaviour you find is a sum of all the waves radiated by each of these elements. Now as it stands, none of those really looks anything like this leading order geometric behaviour. Each of them, when you take them usually, they're basically like a little monopole or something just spreading out in all directions. It's the, it's the phase between them, like when you add them up, you get these leading order geometric effects if you add in for them up. So we're actually rely on basically a matrix solver to find the phases of all the pressures on these little elements so that you get leading order geometric effects if that's what's actually supposed to be there. So it's not the same as a geometric method, but there's a bit more similarity. We're working reflections off surfaces, so maybe we can do something. So there's some potential there if we could find some of terms that look more like these beams rather than all these little tiny elements. So basically I'm kind of I keep saying more questions. How far am I in? 20 minutes in or something, but I'm still setting questions. I'm kind of, it's a good job I said this was work in progress, isn't it? Otherwise, I'm going to struggle to find some conclusions. <coughs> so, in terms of how people normally do it, so in terms of all these little tiny elements, these little elements all over the, over the surface of this faint and scattering sound. People would normally um, assume that either the pressure is constant over an element or varies according to some fairly simple polynomial function. Either of these, you're going to have to make the element small with respect to the acoustic wavelength, so you're going to need more and more of them at high frequencies. But rather than being that, being that prescriptive, we can just basically say that the pressure on the surface of this thing is some weighted sum of some functions and position or basis functions, and we've not really said what they are yet. But we know they have a coefficient, um, and basically it's a sum of all those things. This makes it a bit more flexible to say what we might be doing. Then, just to kind of like put the framework together, what you see is you basically have the scattering integral. So this is when, when you hear people talk about the curve of Helmholtz boundary integral equation. This is the bit that says, given the suppression pressure on the surface, how does it radiate into space? And there's some maths that basically says that. Um, I'm going to try and skip the maths as much as possible. And some of that goes off to your receivers, but some of it basically comes back round and we're going to be impinging on the obstacle again. So it's kind of a loop back kind of property. Then the algorithm, we also have instant sound coming in from the source, and the algorithm needs some sort of way of mapping all this arriving sound back onto this representation of pressure on the surface as a load of numbers, a load of discrete numbers, and this process is going to kind of go round and round and generate things. <coughs> and you don't normally hear people talk about BEM with this kind of loop back, but it is there, and it's very obvious if you look at the time domain BEM, you kind of see that um, you get these waves, the wave come in and it causes a reflection, and then the reflections cause higher order reflections. Uh, so those are the wave reflection, this blue wave will come down here and cause another kind of Turquoise wave, beautiful colours, very high res graphics. It's all very 1995. Um, but this is kind of the process. If you look at the time domain band, this is basically the thing you see, you know, reflections causing other reflections, this kind of chain of like, it's an auto regressive system to use the mathematical term. So it has this, this loop back structure. So I'm, going to, I'm just going to focus first of all on this bit over here. I said I was going to talk about similarities with geometric methods in terms of how things scatter, then later I'll just come back and talk about similarities in terms of how we map things back on. Um, and to do that, I just should probably say that what we're going to deal with is um, we are going to have some sort of integral equation here. I'm not even going to really say what it is. There's going to be some sort of integral adding things up over the surface of however we represented our pressure on the surface in terms of these little basis functions with some sort of kernel function that says how it goes from the point on the surface to the point in space over there. And typically this will be something like a multiple <coughs> function 
or maybe a dipole function typically, or some sort of combination of monopoles and dipoles depending on the material. <coughs> Probably mostly dipoles for that, very rude. But we're not going to get too wound up into that. We're basically going to say there's a way of getting sound from these basis functions out into space, and let's talk about what those basis functions might be. So, I said the silicon basis functions, we're going to have some, have some equations in this slide now, I'm afraid. Um, so, this is an approach which it's been looked at by quite a few guys in applied maths departments mostly, um, where, you, where you try and build, rather than having lots of elements, the smallest vector wavelength for each of them, each of them is kind of like a step, um, you know, rather than trying to approximate this oscillatory behaviour of pressure over a surface by lots of little steps, lots of little elements, we'll try and match what that oscillation function is. Um, we'll try and guess what it is, and then that's going to make life a little bit simpler in terms of how many elements we need. Um, so usually what you do is you write that these basis functions, the things that we're actually going to use on the surface, are a product of some sort of envelope function that's quite slowly varying in space, times some function that oscillates. So it's going to be e to the i and some phase function we're going to pick. It basically says how the phase changes or how the delay changes which way the wave is going to kind of pass it over the surface. Um, so, you know, so if we wanted to <coughs> represent something really complicated like that, if we already knew, if we knew what the underlying oscillation frequency was, then we just needed to approximate the envelope. That's quite slowly varying, so we don't need very many elements or degrees of freedom, uh, and we can do it very, very efficiently. That's the idea. The bad side is that you need to get these phase functions very well chosen. It's actually going to make it worse. It's actually going to make it look more oscillatory if you do this very, very badly. A common choice is plane wave, so basically wave direction. So what, basically what we'd be doing is picking plane waves. So we'd, so we'd be saying we've got a surface, we've got some waves hitting it. Are they coming from this direction or are they coming kind of tangential or surface normal? We're going to try and pick directions where they might basically kind of impinge on the wall from. That's basically what we're going to be trying to do. So can these help them resemble beam tracing? Well, as a first one, I'm just going to take a step back to how image source and things, basically, um, where they are valid, where, where they are valid. Because image source or beam reflections from surfaces are basically completely valid, completely satisfy the acoustic wave equation when the, when the surface of infinite extent. So if you put a, say the source is that you put a, a monopole somewhere and you reflect it, and that is 100% valid when the plane goes on forever and it's 100% rigid. So the question is what happens when people then go on and use these for these models where the room, room surfaces are finite. So we've got some instant pressure wave coming in. Um, coming in from some angle, uh, and then some reflected wave going back out again. So, and these would normally, you basically express that angle of reflection equals angle of instance, so Snell's law. If we just give this uh, a statement, so it's going to say from these plane waves where we've got this kind of dot product term of a wave direction with position in the, the things we're saying which direction it came from. We know on the surface that basically we're going to have some of these two things. And I don't know how many of you guys are out from acoustics, but if you are, you'll know that this is basically the reflected wave is going to be equal to the pressure reflection coefficient times the instant wave. So I can kind of rewrite this like that. Um, if I want to work out what the scattered pressure coming of this thing is, um, so we're into kind of bend lingo here, we're into distinguishing between incident waves from the source and scattered waves, what the surface did in response to it, then there's some integral equation here. I'm not going to labour the details, but what you get out of that when the surface is infinite is that you get that if you're above here, if you're up here, you get the reflected wave like we'd expect, like geometric acoustics tells you. If you're down here, underneath the surface, what you actually get is minus the incident waves, which basically cancels out the incident wave underneath. So it's basically say that you know, the sound from my voice isn't going straight through this wall and into the next room, it's, it's, take, it's get taken in away. So this actually works. Everything works when the surface is infinite. So the questions really are, 
what happens when you make the surface smaller. So, what happens when we basically make this plane smaller? It's not the infinite extent. What happens to this scattering? So we'll just have a look at that. Uh, we'll take a small plane, we'll make it rigid. We'll have an instant plane wave in. So here's the instant wave. Now note that the going following kind of the bound way of thinking about things, the instant wave is defined in the absence of the obstacle. So we go straight through. We're then going to try and correct for that with the scattered wave. Um, I'm going to choose one basis function. This one is oscillatory functions. Uh, so it's going to be a little phase function, a little bit oscillates, and I'm going to choose that to match the instant wave. Uh, I'm going to choose the envelope function. I'm going to basically choose that it exists on the plate and doesn't exist everywhere else. The only plate's there. And I'm going to say that the, 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 the strength of this, the pressure on the um, plate is double what it is coming in. Um, and this is quite a well-known approximation called the Kirchhoff approximation. And from this, putting this in, I can calculate the scattered field, either do using the proper full boundary integral, which is a valid acoustic wave everywhere, or by a geometric approximation. So let's just have a look at those. So this is with this is as a geometric beam tracing algorithm would do it. Here comes the wave, there's our shadow zone, here's our reflection interfering with the other two up here. And um, what we find here is that the, if we took look in, in terms of these, this Ben language of instant wave, scattered wave, we find that in this region here, the scattered wave is the reflected wave that you'd expect from a geometric reflection. And down here it's minus the instant wave, so it's cancelling out and causing this shadow. So that's just done geometrically, but it's imperfectly possible to put, to actually do this, do the integral properly, do, it, do the boundary integral way and find out what diffraction is. And now you have the same thing, and hopefully you can still see the leading order behaviors the same. We've still got this um, reflective wave going up here and causes this interference. We've still got a shadow behind. Well, the difference is they're all kind of now smoothly joined up by some diffraction. So there's no these kind of artificial boundaries where things don't satisfy the acoustic wave equation. We basically got it all nicely joined up. So we've gone from something like that that had these discontinuities, where in your model you're walking through, you're walking through your virtual oralization, and you can hear the sound, and suddenly you walk across this transition, and suddenly it switches off, and then back on again as you kind of move, you move into a process where there's a bit more believable and obeys the physics more correctly. And um, what's actually kind of worked out quite interesting is that these things are actually a little bit easier to evaluate as, as well. So typically, um, if you looked at these kind of beams, um, they would have basically, because you, this is a, this is a 2D panel in three dimensions, and the same rules apply to BEM over a surface and apply to FTDD, we've got to add up something over the surface, we've got to sort of divide it up into little bits that are small with respect to wavelength to do so, so the cost goes up with frequency squared because we, we increase the resolution in two dimensions as we have actually compute the value of this thing. In contrast, the, the uh, geometric beam was had no cost, the cost scale of frequency to compute. We basically just sort of say geometrically where it was and the phase is a very simple function. And what it turns out is that actually this kind of correction, this diffraction correction, is actually quite cheap to compute as well. So it goes order f instead of order f squared, which is a lot cheaper. Um, and something we're working on at the minute is actually getting this um, frequency co cost independence, so that actually you'll be able to do these things with diffraction with no increased cost if you go up in frequency, which would be the big result. So we're kind of looking at a model where sound comes in from certain angles. We map it onto some of these wave directions, uh, like I was showing. Um, try, try and find what the wave directions are. This is a bit of this is a bit open question. We'll come back to in a second. Um, then you have some obstacle material model that says how the sound coming in gets turned back into outward waves. And then you radiate these waves back out into the, the, the medium. Um, as I was just showing last slide, we can now do that a lot more computationally cheaply than we used to be able to, which now makes it a more viable approach. 
So we kind of see that if we know, if we kind of could get a good estimate of the wave directions as, as things are coming in and hitting a surface and re-radiating from them, we could actually do a full wave solution actually relatively cheaply. So the problem now becomes this bit on the, on the left of how we find those wave directions. Um, so we're going to kind of concentrate over here. Um, and there's different ways of doing this testing scheme. The one I'm going to talk about is called uh, sort of the lurking bend formulation. And, uh, off we go, we'll have some more integrals because you know, if you don't know what to do with something, what do you do? Well, you yeah, throw in another integral, that's usually the way to solve it, right? Um, but what we're actually doing with this, so we've, got, we've got two things coming in here. This is the instant sound, it's mapping that instant wave with some sort of testing function here onto some coefficient. This is this kind of loop back, so it was the wave that was scattered from some other part of the obstacle. We're trying to find out you know, the wave that's coming down from that ceiling, how, what, what angle is it when it comes and hits something down here. So that's basically, we're trying to find out that and trying to map it onto some sort of number or coefficient as well. So these are both waves coming, coming out of the room from some different directions, regardless of whether they came from the source or some other part of the uh, the other part, some other part of the boundary. So, question now is, you know, will Ben do this the same as a geometric method? So let's just sort of take this little interval here, so the one for an instant wave is slightly simpler. And let's just again set up the situation. So we'll, we'll again we'll start by looking at a surface that's infinite, because that's where geometric stuff usually works. Um, and here we have an instant wave here, just coming in from some direction. And this is basically like having a massive microphone array across the surface. So we've got a massive microphone array, it's like we've covered our surface boundary in lots and lots of virtual microphones and they're all busy detecting sound. And then we're going to try and beam steer and find out where it came from. And this little function says how it beam steer. Um, there's our instant plane wave with some direction D, DI. Um, and usually what we do for our testing function, if we're, if we're looking for things that look like oscillatory plane waves, then we test them with the conjugate of the wave we're looking for. That's mathematically what we would do. We take the plane wave we're looking for, we conjugate it. And if I stick this stuff in, what some of you who, I don't know how many of you look at this sort of thing, but some of you may begin to recognise this is turned into a Fourier transform. And essentially what we're going to find is something that gives us one if those directions match exactly, and zero if they're anything else. So what we've actually basically discovered is Snell's law again. That you know by some complicated maths we've basically said that if a plane wave comes in from that direction and we look at it with a with a surface that goes on for infinite, we have an infinite aperture with infinite resolution, then we'll directly exactly find what that angle was. It's basically what we said. It's kind of a non-result. What, what is interesting though is to ask, well, again, what happens in reality is we make those surfaces finite, what then happens? And again, this is a standard sort of thing you'd see. It is the kind of, of all sorts of problems you see in signal processing situations. You only are talking about time domain window in signals and you get kind of side loads in frequency that look like a, a sink. What happens here is I'm doing a spatial window because my surface is getting cut off. That gives me side loads in terms of detection angle. So I'm looking for a wave over here, and, rather, and I think I'm looking over there, but actually I'm kind of looking a bit in all these other directions as well, with these side loads in my microphone array. Um, so that's basically the kind of thing you'll get. Is that you still find that the main loads looking in the right direction, but you've got all these side loads uh, that are kind of detecting loads of other spatial noise, for want of a better term. And what those side loads are, as anyone with any signal processing experience will know, they're dependent on what the window function was. So in this case, I've just said that my window function is a rectangle, because it's basically zero over here, then it becomes one on the surface, and then it's zero over here again. So it's a rectangular window, which is pretty much the worst kind of window you can choose. So rather than doing that, what we might do um, is we might choose to actually have some sort of tapered window function. So when we set up these, our definition of pressure on the surface, we might decide that we'll make well, these, some of these oscillation functions, so that little 
pollen over on the cell where the envelope was, rather than kind of cutting them off into little boxes, we'll kind of just interpolate between them and make them smooth. And that massively improves things on a number of levels. First of all, when we look at our, our little functions of where sound goes from an oscillatory function, we find that if we had, had it all over the surface equal in sort of equal magnitude and suddenly cut it off at the end, then we get all this really strong diffra diffraction here and the, and the main beam spreads out quite significantly in lots of directions. Whereas if we actually take the data at the end of the surface, so this is done with a Hannon envelope, so the kind of the, the intensity of the wave on the surface it kind of goes up and then comes down again then actually you get a much narrower main load in terms of direction. You don't get all this spreading out in lots of other directions. So we actually see that our, our, our waves become more beam-like when we do this. Similarly, when we're doing our testing function, um, we find that we get side loads, like I say, in terms of the detection. Um, so if we had a rectangular envelope, so all these microphone signals are weighted equally, then we get a main load in the right direction, we get all these little side load detecting things in other directions due to the finite aperture of the array. Whereas if we do a hand envelope, on the sort of draw on the same scale as kind of sensitivity polar plot, uh, just tapering in the weighting of these different mics, then you would just get the main load and the side loads would be massively, massively reduced. Um, the other thing that you see, you probably notice here, is you get something called front-back confusion, uh, which is present in a lot of microphone arrays, that you can't tell when you've got an array of microphones whether the sound came from that way, or whether it came from that way, because the thing is basically symmetric, but it can't distinguish. Um, and um, again, there's something you can do about that, you can use a combination of uh, microphones that are omnidirectional and figure of eight microphones, virtually of course, this is all in a virtual algorithm, but effectively you use the right combination of omni microphone and figure of eight microphones, and you can steer this array around so it has no back sensitivity. Um, and that's kind of quite nice. It's also it's mathematically quite interesting. If any of you didn't work, look into BEM, there's something quite famous called the Burton Miller method. Uh, which is to do with um, eradication of a particular type of problem um, and, and gets used quite widely and this is basically the equivalent of that you can show, it's the equivalent, equivalent thing. Going back to this, this diagram here though, um, the, one of the most important things is in loop back uh, and when you hear people talk about BEM, they talk about the fact it has a full interaction matrix and what that means is that every element on the surface basically radiates to every other element on the surface, regardless of whether they're next to each other or not. Um, and that's basically represented by this path here. And um, basically we're going to have a massive matrix that's got the, the number of elements squared entries of everything talking to everything else. And with a normal bare matrix, so that's full and it's quite problematic um, to, to store and evaluate. But again, one of the things you see with these beams is that um, they only basically you only get a significant number of matrices if things line up geometrically. So if I had a, a so basically I imagine sound being scattered from some element here and sensed on some element here, that's basically like a speaker array radiating sound out, and this one's like a microphone array sensing it. So if I'm kind of pushing sound out in that direction and looking for sound in that direction, then the result would be that I'd get a, very, a large coefficient. You get a good match, because the same direction, lots of overlap, this microphone array is looking for that wave, I get a large coefficient, this matrix of kind of wave direction to wave direction. If this was radiating that way, then I'd get probably something very small, because the wave was being radiated in a different direction, there's no spatial overlap between these two things. Similarly, if that was radiated kind of diagonally, um, the, the, the micro is looking over there, then it won't get anything because there's a direction mismatch. Um, but actually, if it was looking that way, maybe I'd get a little bit more because there's some sort of beam overlap. But if I was looking at the next elements along, then I'd get a very large coefficient. So, so these, the, I have, in principle, a massive matrix of every possible spatial panel with every possible wave direction talking to every other one, but actually most of them 
are insignificant because it's only when the beam from a certain panel goes and hits another beam that you actually get a large number. So you can show that basically this um, results in uh, matrices that are actually a lot cheaper and a lot cheaper to compute if you can basically guess where things are going to happen um, and they, um, they don't require anything as much memory to store as you would expect because they're basically sparse. Um, so, just clock watching. Um, the question really that I'm basically poses is how do you pick these, these wave directions? Um, so we've kind of seen that uh, there's, there's kind of a number of benefits. We've seen that um, our, our scatter integral, the thing on the right side of the green, is like a loudspeaker array that kind of beam forward in different directions. Um, if you've got an infinite plane that agrees with geometric methods, then if it's over a finite panel, as you have in a real room, then it's basically a beam plus some sort of correction term. The tested integral mapping sound from the room back onto these di wave directions is like array beam forming. Um, so it's basically measuring the amplitude of a particular wave direction present within the sound arriving at the surface. Um, so it allows geometric and higher order diffraction terms to be mapped onto these, these waves together. So, so usually these things are done separately uh, in a geometric method. You can do the whole thing together. Um, and again, measuring an infinite plane matches what you'd expect geometrically. Measuring a refined plane gives you sine lobes. Um, so I was trying to read this. So really, what basically what we have to do is try and pick some directions um, very very well, because um, this is this is going to this has the potential to work if we can basically guess what those directions will be. So just um, to give a quick recap of that, uh, there's kind of two um, schemes of this already. Most of the ones that have presently been done work by choosing wave directions in advance. Um, so you kind of go, well, I don't know what's going on, I'll just guess what these wave directions are before I start. Um, and there's two schemes of that. There's one called partition of unity, then, where they go, well, we don't know what the wave directions are, so we'll just kind of space them evenly and angle. We'll pick that we're going to have 20 wave directions we'll space them evenly in angle for want of anything better to do. Um, and this is, is very easy because you don't have to worry too much about what the problem is you're modeling, um, but it doesn't basically break the link between the frequency and the number of degrees of freedom you've got to use. It gives an improvement, but it doesn't um, really do anything that's really going to um, get used this for full bandwidth oralization. In contrast, there's something else, again, these got horrible names because they're invented by mathematicians. Um, hybrid numerical asymptotic, then, not to be confused with hybrid acoustic modeling, which some of you guys do. You know, it's basically, let's all get confused using the same words for two different things. Um, but basically, what that's about is about choosing wave directions to match leading order directions in a geometric method. Um, so you effectively do a geometric method. You work out what these low order wave directions would be according to that, and then you put them into a BEM scheme and try and use them. And that works okay, but you need to know a lot about the problem before you start. So, what I'm kind of currently working on is something else where I'm trying to do this iteratively, because beam tracing basically goes along by, um, you know, you've got a source, it comes along, it hits a wall, that's my direction. We then go off and we reflect off and we hit something else and we know the direction over there because we, we hit it. So you work in reflection order. You, you basically go along hitting things and then working out what the angles are. And I'm kind of interested in the possibility of doing the same thing with them, which you know is possible potentially because it actually can be written iteratively. Remember, I, in the first slides, I was talking about doing this for early time for low reflection orders. Um, so effectively what we're doing is we're we're going to look at an algorithm where sound comes in and we kind of like, you know, you're at a surface with a microphone array sweeping around looking for where the sound's coming from, and you effectively latch on to the direction that the sound's coming from and say, okay, I've sensed most sounds coming here, so I'll put that wave direction in my system. Now I can work out what the reflection coefficient will be for that direction. Now I can re-radiate it with diffraction, so it's a valid solution of the wave equation. Off that goes somewhere else. And the important thing about that idea is that if you've got a source coming in 
you might have come in, and this is, this is just a very simple kind of um, sort of trial simulation idea. You've got a source coming in. You can see these little arrows here, I suppose, they're in, are indicating the, the direction of wave arrival that the, the microphone rate is found by analysing um, the pressure coming in. What it actually is, again, it's got sort of side loads, it's a bit of a peak. Um, so you look at wave direction, you look at the quality, this, 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 each of these graphs with different elements is um, kind of wave direction like that along the x-axis versus <coughs> some, some number that's the quality of the match up the left axis. And you can find, you can see they're all basically some sort of peak. And what's quite, what, quite, quite nice is that if you just geometrically guess what the angle should be by drawing a line from the source to the, to the element, that's indicated by these yellow lines in the middle, and basically, it basically more or less always tells you where to look. Uh, so you know where you're looking, but then you can actually compute this microphone array and go, well, actually, this isn't, a, you know, at lower frequencies where there's some other wave effects going on. Okay, maybe there's a little bit of argy bargy around that wave direction. Maybe it's not just purely what the geometric algorithm told me. And now what's important is if I then take one of these elements down here, with a certain wave direction, so how will that re-radiate? Then, if I look at the re-radiation of that one in isolation, the re-radiation of that element includes the diffraction from it. So when I then go over here, and then in my second order start detecting where what, what sound is instant on these panels at the next reflection order, the diffraction necessarily is already taken into account. Um, so, Unlike my first analogy of the oboe in the pit diffracting over the barrier and then you know it diffracts over the front of the balcony and we can't do anything with it, in this kind of method actually when you actually work these things out it would be able to track the fact that you know the sounds come over, it's diffracted over the wall and then we're looking at it from somewhere up in the balcony sweeping around with a microphone array going well it doesn't matter whether the sound came past something that was diffracted we're just looking at incoming sound, so we can basically sweep around and look for it. So it's, it's quasi-geometric, but it includes diffraction. So just to, to wrap up, these are the other cards. So I said it was seeking, I said it was in progress. Um, this kind of concept of incoming waves, mapping incoming wave directions, re-radiating them again. I've kind of done some test cases on things like um, Playing sort of cylindrical surfaces and things, and there's um, some some fast ways of integrating the stuff for those kind of geometries. Um, spherical elliptical should be possible too. Arbitrary curvature surfaces are unlikely possible, but that's the same for beam tracing image source. I mean, this is why Odeon only lets you have planar surfaces because you can only do image source with planar surfaces, and basically the same restrictions are going to apply to this. Because that's the same idea. Those envelope functions. Best choice of those is a bit unclear. The smooth overlapping one gives benefits like I've shown in terms of kind of improved directionality when the microphone array sensing direction, narrower lobes when you're re-radiating sound, but it makes the uh, solution a bit complicated. And when you're trying to deal with corners where suddenly you've got something that's planar and now you've got a discontinuity in angle or suddenly it's curved, it, joining those bits up is a little bit of a, of a fuzzier kind of thing that's proven a bit difficult. Um, at the moment, the integration cost still increases with frequency, even though we've kind of got the number of degrees of freedom under control. Um, though there is some, some um, we are making progress with that. Um, so, just to conclude, uh, I think there's a requirement for a numerical acoustic prediction algorithm which does the low order reflections, which are so crucial for uh, spatial cues in, in the human hearing system, uh, that does them in a full bandwidth way, that does it for, you know, all the way through the order, especially for the low frequencies as well as the high order together. Um, you basically want it to be compatible with, i.e. ideally derived from one of the wave methods that does have all that, does satisfy the wave equation, so FEM or BEM or FTDD or something, at low frequencies with a known density is low. And you want to be compatible with stochastic methods for late time high frequencies, and then you want to be able to, to continue to use a standard low frequency method for, for late time at low frequencies as well. Um, 
kind of done a bit of a skip through, but I've kind of shown how these oscillatory basis functions can create theme-like behaviour. Um, and as you make the effective frequency higher, what you'll find is those things become more and more beam-like. So as you ramp the frequency up, this kind of behaviour becomes more and more like a geometric algorithm. Um, and I said two, so I skipped one of these because I thought you were all getting a bit tired. It's, uh, it's six o'clock? It's six o'clock, that o'clock's wrong. Um, so, I've actually talked about one, but basically this idea of kind of working with reflection order, detecting with a microphone array what, where the sound comes from and then re-radiating those directions is what we're working with. So it's, 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 it's built on boundary element or boundary integral equations, but it works like a geometric reflection process. So that's what we're doing. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jonathan. We have time for a couple of questions. Hello. Hi, thanks for the talk. Uh, so I'm not that I remember six persons, so this one is kind of new to me. Sure. Uh, but I was looking at like all the different methods that you showed, and you kind of patched together like different mm. things. And I was wondering if uh, there is a way to keep track, for example, of the accuracy of your final algorithm, of the accuracy of your final algorithm given that like you're using all like these different methods and approximations? Sure, yeah, well I mean I think, yeah, I mean that's a, that's a good question. Um, typically, what you do in these kind of situations, you, you, people tend to benchmark some of these more complicated algorithms on, on simpler problems where you can, you can either find a solution analytically to the thing or it's, sufficiently kind of tractable that you can use one method um, like FTDD or FEM or something for the whole range and then, and then compare the two. Um, the other thing that people do uh, is measure real rooms and see how well the results match in different bandwidths. Uh, and particularly now, um, with this sort of drive towards oralization and hearing things, what you're starting to see is they're not just measuring the, these kind of acoustic um, objective metrics, they're actually taking dummy heads in with microphones in the ears and measuring rooms and then getting people to listen to what you predicted versus what the what the thing heard and uh, and see whether they basically sound the same and I know some of you have done listening tests along those lines. So that's kind of the process. But you know, I take your point. As you start to build more complexity and there's more space for things to go wrong, absolutely. Yeah. It's kind of I mean what I'm trying to do here is trying to acquire some of the efficiency that these geometric algorithms have been around for 20 years, have, but actually get the wave behaviour in there as well. Um, so, say for really complicated situations where you had, um, you know, kind of turbulence and air effects, and obviously these guys work on simulating, um, you know, kind of wind instruments and things, and I would suggest for a minute that this would work for that, because you've obviously got all that kind of flow stuff to deal with. Um, but in the simple case of a room, where actually some of the geometric work methods work not too badly. It's a question of, you know, what can we build, rather than throwing everything out, what can we build on top of the current way of doing things to just sort of correct that low frequency and it's basically the angle. So do you see your work more applied to architectural acoustics? Yeah, definitely. Maybe gaming and things like that? Um, so people use um, related methods for gaming. Um, so typically, what you typically with gaming, the the emphasis is much more on speed of response and interactivity than on physical accuracy. Uh, so, we re so really, we're very much talking about plausibility and it's stuff like you know, if the helicopter goes behind the building, you know, it goes a bit muffled rather than just you know, you know, if you went behind the building and the helicopter still sounds the same, that's wrong. If it goes behind the building, and just switches off. That's wrong. What actually happens is it kind of the treble fades out and then it comes back round. So you, you see people doing designing algorithms to do that kind of thing um, in a much more heuristic sort of way because uh, they're not aiming for physical accuracy. They're aiming for plausibility and they're aiming to do it as quickly as possible on on a PlayStation. So. Um, I have two questions. Kind of the last one just came came about from your comment. Like you said, you might be able to get those edge diffraction kind of sources with order one. Do you think those could be integrated into like interactive like games or something? 
is a cheap way to do. Um... Um, so there's a method called frustrum tracing. I know people do, uh, where you kind of you, you use the physical optics approximation to diffraction, where you kind of assume that sound comes in and it, you know, you've got a wave and kind of going along and it kind of hits an edge and it's coming along and suddenly it hits the edge and it kind of goes and swings around like that and keeps going. And people do that kind of method of, of diffraction. It's just a very simple kind of first order approximation. So, so um, I can't remember the name of the, the chap up to, but there is there's a guy in the States who's got a games engine that does frustrum tracing for diffraction. Again, only to first order, because once you get past first order and you've spun that beam round, instead of having something that's going in a straight line, you've got some really complicated cylindrical wave thing. Um, that's a complete nightmare to do anything else with. So usually they just sort of do that order and then you hear it and if it then goes off and tries to diffract around the door frame, no, you forgot about that then. You know, that's, that's enough. We'll do first order and that's, you know, that's, that's as much far as we'll go. Because otherwise it just gets too complicated. Um, I'm, not, I'm not aiming this in any sense of real time thing, okay. so thinking of offline. So what, what is interesting though about um, Boundary element simulations, though, in this in this regard, is that when you solve the solution, you solve the solution of the boundary of the room. It's not receiver position dependent, and the kind of post-processing step. So, going back to my diagram, um, this this flowchart diagram. Um, the first stage is to kind of like bring in the instant sound, work out this kind of loop back and find out what the pressure is on the surface. Generally, that's the difficult time-consuming stage. Then once you know that, find the scattered sound off the walls to some point in space where a receiver is relatively cheap. Um, so if you, if you solve what the pressure is in the room for, um, for a particular source configuration, then moving the receiver around afterwards is relatively a lot less expensive. So you want to walk around in the room, it's not so bad. So um, the other question was about like different ways you can kind of um, make these full matrices sparser. And I guess like this approach is attempting to do that. Mm -hmm. um, can you also use uh, <coughs> multiple methods? And or just I haven't really got that far. Really compare, but fast multipole methods are, uh, are, are based on some of the same ideas. They're based on kind of taking sort of clusters of bits of obstacles, so, you know, I don't know, it's lectern, and saying the sound's scattered off that, rather than being a million, billion elements each a centimetre of size, what we'll do is we'll aggregate the effect of all of those onto kind of like a set of either plane waves or spherical harmonic waves, centered in that kind of region and we'll talk about the amplitude of them. If you're already working in that idea that you're going to restate a whole load of little elements as plane waves going out in certain directions, which is what fast multipole does, then that's kind of what I'm already doing on the surface. So I haven't got as far as really actually looking into it, but I can quite imagine that the two things should be relatively compatible. Yeah. I have one very quick basic question, yeah. which is a because that was a hard question. <laughs> 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 Um, just for those of us who are not boundary element method, which is probably most people, yeah, okay. so, some of us at least. So you're talking about describing sources in terms of their representation on the surface, mm. and you have these basis functions for which, if I've understood, the reconstructed wave is highly dependent on the phase. And yeah, as yeah. they described on the surface. So how do you do that in a physically plausible way in terms of knowledge about the material properties? Do you have to kind of make that up for different materials, or is that stuff that you know from measurements? So, when I say it's very dependent on phase, what it's very dependent on, if you're trying to like, if you're trying to think of a wave coming in and reflecting off the floor and then going up like that, it's very dependent on the phase from point to point spatially, ah. because we're relying on the, the constructive interference to between all these kind of little bits of the surface to push the wave back off that way like it should go, rather than just kind of everywhere. Um, so, it's very dependent on phase. In terms of material data, um, you can kind of imagine that 
you could model this carpet as a material that was purely resistive and just attenuated sound by 30% and then re radiated straight away. And, and you would get the same behaviour of that shum, shum, as if all of the carpet took energy in, stored it for a little while, and then kicked it back out. So long as, so long as the material data is all done consistently, the wave direction bit doesn't matter too much. Um, however, there are issues to do with um, kind of the, the, the phase of reflections of material. And um, one of the things that they say with geometric method, I heard Jen Tolga Rindle, who's one of the main guys behind Odin, say this, is that Odin reliably underpredicts the. Well, hang on, let's get this right way around. Um, yeah, it makes room small sound smaller than they are because the reflections off materials happen instantaneously. There's no phase lag, they just deal with the absorption coefficient. So sound comes in and hits something fuzzy, like this chair, and then comes straight back out again. Whereas in reality, there's some phase lag, the, the sound's energy stored in the material for a while and then re released. And it doesn't do that. And when you cumulatively add that effect of over whole rooms, you find that actually they're, it's like they're all a bit smaller than they should be. Everything's around just a wee bit too small. Oh, yeah, exactly. Um, and that's a material data problem. One of the things that came with the workshop last year is that actually is yeah, getting this material data and getting it reasonable is actually a massive, massive other elephant in the room, certainly. So. On that particular point, I think, well, thank you once again. Okay.